Today I'm joined by not one but two guests, Glenn Crocker and Chris Waters from the Life Sciences team at JLL. Glenn, Chris, hello. Hello. Hi, how are you? Yeah, good, thank you. So I'm really interested to pick your brains on this topic. Earlier this year, the government announced uh, a record increase in public investment into research and development for the next few years. And this sector's obviously been getting a bit of a moment in the spotlight with the global COVID response effort. Chris, perhaps you could kick us off. What's the sector looked like for, for the last nine months and uh, what's the outlook for 2021? Thanks, Amy. Well, it's definitely been under the, the spotlight. It's really being driven by the fact that the demand drivers for the sector around venture capital funding, um, public sector funding that you mentioned, and also the growth in startups is fueling occupier demand. So there's a lot of um, business that are increasingly looking for space. And that's naturally perked the interest of investors. So We've seen a lot of interest from the investor community, both from specialist developers, operators, but also people that are looking at this for the first time. So both Glenn and I have, have spoken to those, um, those companies, and I think we're continuing to see sustained interest right up into the, to the end of 2020. We did a survey actually as a JLL house um, early this year where we asked investors where we thought the greatest opportunity might be in the next five years and life sciences was at the top um, i don't know what it was last year but i'm pretty confident it wasn't at the top of the list that gives you an indication of um, where the investor movement is going and we're seeing a lot of opportunities come to the market so i think from the last nine months it's been really positive actually that's really good to hear. I'm sure it's exciting times for you guys as you look into 2021. And um, Glenn, there's, there's clearly high demand in this sector, but what are the barriers to, to development? I guess one of the main barriers is the fact that it's a really complex market and uh, it really needs to be understood by anybody going into it. And if they don't do that, there's a, a possibility of getting it quite badly wrong. So the life science sector is pretty diverse. It isn't just one type of occupier. There are many types of occupier, each with really different facility needs and different growth characteristics and different occupier needs. And even more complicated, the proportions of different types of company vary from location to location. So you could have a lot of medical technology companies in one area and a lot of therapeutics companies in another, and both need very different types of um, for types of space. And so before you even consider a development or buying into a, a, an opportunity, you need to understand what that market is, what the subsectors are you're proposing to address and, and what the rationale and the arguments are for it. So doing really good market analysis before any development is, is important. And, and if you haven't got the, that in place, then that can be quite a significant barrier. Um, and then of course, construction costs are another one that people always come back to. It does cost more to build laboratories, although um, not necessarily as much as more as people sometimes think. So really understanding the different subsectors before launching into the um, sector. And we've heard a lot of talk about acceleration of trends this year in, in all sorts of different places. I'm really interested to get your view, Glenn, on, on how you think the life sciences sector is going to evolve, particularly when it comes to advances in technology, the different, um, the different needs of tenants and, and occupiers. Yeah, it's really interesting. Over recent years, we've seen, I guess, two key but related trends. One is um, increased laboratory automation, and the other is the emergence of artificial intelligence and machine learning in drug discovery and development, and in, in healthcare provision as well. And both are having similar impacts on lab and office space. So automation, for example, means that when you go into a laboratory nowadays, it tends to be full of equipment with lots of flashing lights, but not many people. And the scientists will go in and they'll set up an experiment and then they'll leave it to run and spend much of their time in the office. And then AI is increasingly used to discover and develop new drugs in silica rather than in the wet lab. For example, Google's DeepMind just the other day announced that its algorithms can now accurately predict protein structure from amino acid sequence. And that may not sound very much, but it is a huge deal in the, in the industry. 
and it cuts a massive amount of cost and time out. But more importantly, from a real estate perspective, it means work that was previously done in a lab can now be done at a computer. And that doesn't mean that wet labs are going to disappear, but it will increasingly change how the space is used. So more time spent in offices means that we need to rethink what that space looks like and how much you need. And, and if people aren't going to spend so much time in labs, then you know, do labs need to have windows, for example? Um, obviously, it depends on what you're doing. And I should say some labs will still have lots of people in them. But, uh, and it's not a one size fits all. But if um, these changes are happening, then we do need to think about them. That's so fascinating. Do you think these changes will make it easier to create flexible solutions rather than very bespoke and specific developments? Quite possibly, yes. Yeah, particularly if you're looking at more of the office component. And so, you know, to date, the office element has been the afterthought for, for scientists and it's not really been often very well designed and uh, not very flexible. But nowadays, I think we need to think more about what that space looks like and, and really, really design it properly for them because they're spending a lot of time on it. This clinical environment doesn't, doesn't work anymore. Uh, Chris, I also wanted to touch on the rest of the UK, um, the levelling up agenda is another hot topic this year and obviously the Golden Triangle is a, it's a, a kind of recognised global, global brand but could you tell me a bit more about what's happening in the other UK cities? Yeah, of course. I mean, the golden triangle of uh, Cambridge, Oxford and London is definitely getting all of the attention and, and naturally so because that's really where the highest number of companies, number of employees are um, and a lot of where the, the venture capital funding is going. Um, and, you know, just touching back to what we started with around the investor interest, naturally people that are looking at this for the first time are focusing on the golden triangle because it's it's the natural place to start but glenn and i also actively encouraging parties and, and people who are looking at this sector to look outside of the golden triangle because there are many opportunities elsewhere regionally um some of them that sort of that i would mention that stick in the mind um probably one of the most uh the largest the most established outside of the golden triangle is around the oxford road corridor in manchester um, a lot of commercial activity that's happened there. Um, there's an emerging innovation district. Um, there's a particular site called ID Manchester that the University of Manchester is running a process for at the moment to find a developer and investor partner for. Um, that's a 17 acre site, one and a half billion pounds um, campus. So huge amount of development, close to four million square feet and very much a focus on innovation. And taking in the broader definition of what Glenn said around life sciences in terms of innovation and R&D companies. So incredibly exciting. Another one would be um, up in Leeds, again, another innovation district um, that when you look at the adjacencies with the University of Leeds and the fact that they've got the Nexus Centre there already, there is an existing hub of commercial activity to build upon. So um, once they start to bring forward the new hospital through the Leeds General Infirmary site, that will be another great opportunity. Um, and the final one I'd, I'd just mention is the Edinburgh Biocorter, one that's again got significant potential, great opportunity of um, four public sector bodies coming together looking for a, a long term partner. So I think that would be a good example of a public private partnership that, as we know, um, when it works well, it can be excellent. So those opportunities do exist and um, I think the plug to anyone would be if you are looking at the sector you know the golden triangle is is where a lot of the activity is happening and naturally so but it is it is bigger than that. In those knowledge clusters that are emerging across the UK are you seeing specialisms emerging on a kind of place base so that we're not competing competing with each other across the UK? Yeah definitely one that springs to mind is um, around Stevenage so that's definitely um, created a USP around uh, cell and gene therapy um, around the GSK campus in Stevenage and, and there are others I think if you look at particularly the science parks um, around the country they may have a particular edge around a particular specialism or a science specialism and I think yeah. those that are looking at this holistically 
in terms of multiple sites, you can build up specialisms across across each of those as part of your portfolio, really. Well, I was going to add in, so in, Birm in the Birmingham area, for example, which has obviously a strong engineering and manufacturing background, uh, medical technologies are pretty strong. If you go to um, the Nottingham area, for example, which has got the Boots history and AstraZeneca just down the road and a very strong chemistry and pharmacology department, there's a lot of contract research organisations, um, Cambridge, uh, lots of therapeutic companies developing new treatments for the likes of cancer and Alzheimer's and, and so on. And, and so it does vary hugely, as Chris said, across the country. I also think it goes back to what you said, Glenn, around knowing your market. So I think a key part of that is you're if you're looking to bring forward new space or build on an existing cluster is understanding who the companies are that are there today or might be attracted there and you know what's driving those decisions. Is it a particular specialism around a piece of research? Is it proximity to an academic institution? It's all part of that that story, that picture that you need to build up before making an investment, either as an occupier or an investor, really. Mm -hmm. Well, that brings me to my final question. Obviously, there's huge scope for growth and there's lots of innovation and exciting things happening in this sector. What does this sector look like for you in 10 years time? I think in 10 years time, I mean, well, definitely in the short order, if you look at all of the demand drivers that I mentioned at the beginning around um, public private sector investment and the growth of startups, we can only see it going one way. And we're, you know, we're very positive about this sector as a, as a JLL house and when we're advising clients, because we think that that demand and growth will continue and occupiers will continue to need space. And they'll need more of it and investors will naturally follow. Um, a big que a question we're commonly asked um, is, you know, how does um, the UK compare to the US and do you think we'll ever get there? And I think the sheer size and scale and maturity of the US is, is at a different level to the UK. But, you know, we are, we are growing and maturing um, as, as, a, as a sector. And I think, you know, if you compare us um, also to some other European locations, they're also starting to mature um, as markets. So maybe I'll let Glenn actually finish with the, the true crystal ball glazing, but um, I think it's very positive overall. Yeah, I, I, I guess I would say we're only at the very beginning of the development of this sector. It's been a long time coming. It's been a very slow burn, but now you really do get a sense that the trajectory is if not exponential, then, then very sharply upwards. And so in 10 years time, I think we're going to see a much, much bigger life science sector. I think it's going to be broader across multiple centers in the, in the UK, um, all to where the existing university strength is. That's where we'll see a lot of the clusters continuing to develop. But I'd be surprised if it wasn't two or three times bigger than it, than it is today. And as Chris said, you know, people look to the US and say, um, the US is 10 years ahead, so in 10 years time, we're going to look like the US. I don't think we'll be quite like that because you know, the money that's flowing into the sector there, it just isn't the same as in Europe, but we will certainly be an awful lot bigger than we are today. And there's a, there's a massive amount of growth to come. So one to watch, clearly. Thank you both so much for sharing your insights today. Uh, I look forward to checking in with you again um, to see how things have developed in September at LREF and, uh, and beyond. Thanks very much, Amy. Thank you, Amy.